right, Celeste and Kevin, thanks for joining me. Thanks, thanks for having us. us. So we only have 30 minutes. I want to jump right in. Um, Kevin, maybe you could start by just giving everybody a little bit of an overview of Fair Market. Yeah. So at Fair Market, we're an autonomous sourcing solution. We help large enterprises automate the way they buy goods and services. Uh, the space is traditionally very legacy and archaic. So we brought in a new innovative way for companies to, to handle the tens of thousands of purchases they do that with people, they just can't get their arms around. So we, uh, we were fired up to have GGV join the journey in 2020. It's been a Great partnership so far. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having us on board along with uh, the kind folks at Insight and also Omers who led your most recent round. And maybe Kevin, just give folks a little bit of sense of the scale of the, the business and some of the customers you guys have around the world because I think that's helpful and relevant. Yeah, um, so right now from a scale of business, we've uh, just closed our Series C as you mentioned. <clears throat> so very excited about that. Uh, we're about 115, 120 people. Uh, for our ICP ideal customer profile, we go for we work with large enterprises. So we work with like the British Petroleum's of the world. Uh, we work with the Capital Ones of the world um, across most verticals. Uh, we've just noticed that at these very large companies, they've just been stuck in their way of the legacy players. So what we're doing is we're helping to show how they can augment that, bring in a new innovative approach. Um, so it, it's very much an enterprise SaaS play. Um, that being said, like we still have to stay very agile. Because what we don't want to become is another legacy player. It's how do we keep thinking about it differently and saying, how do you augment people and do yeah. that with that? And just to be clear, the legacy players are folks like SAP, Ariba, right? Coupa. Yeah, so like the, or the oracles of the world. Oracle, we'll, yeah. Which will always have their place. Um, yeah. That being said, like they have so much going on that it's really difficult to be very yeah, targeted yeah. and yeah. say, how do you apply tech to this one specific area? And Celeste... Six months into fair market, give people a little bit of sense of your background. Thanks. Yeah, it's hard to believe it's been six months. I can't <laughs> believe it. Um, but yes, I joined fair market in April um, as CFO, and I'm thrilled to be here. It's been everything and more that I expected. Um, a little bit about my background. I came up through the FP&A ranks. Okay, so I actually started my career in operations and then moved what I thought was a very natural um, move into operational finance. And I loved the always being that connectivity in operations, like uh, the connective glue between departments, right? And then when I moved into FP&A, what I really loved was the reporting, the cool modeling, the needle moving projects that we got a chance to be in, and most importantly, business partnering. Mm -hmm. And so throughout my career, I've, I've had the opportunity to watch this in, my, in the last few decades, the FP&A function kind of blossom and grow to a strategic, a strategic way. But I've been at small, large, public and private companies. Um, most right before uh, joining Fair Market, I was at a, a VP of Finance at a company called Platform Nine, enterprise SaaS selling Kubernetes. Prior to that, I was at Sumo Logic, heading up FPA and seeing that scale from you know under twenty to pre-IPO scale. And then uh, prior to that, I was at VMware and a, a couple other public companies. So really grateful to have had the experience I've had. Amazing. And just to give folks some context, so. One of my passions in life is a strong belief that uh, enterprise software companies benefit greatly from having a finance exec as early as possible. And I really try to encourage our founders to bring somebody on once they definitely once they cross five million of, of ARR, uh, some wait till 10. But I, I just I've seen it make such a huge impact over and over. And so. Kevin, maybe maybe back to you a little bit of, you know, as you mentioned, we first invested in 2020 and you and I started having this conversation. But what was the journey like for you as a founder and CEO to thinking about having, you know, somebody of Celeste caliber in this role? And how did you how did you A, think about it? And then B, what did the process look like to to run the search and, and end up landing her? Yeah. And and you uh thankfully, I appreciate it. you didn't do and I told you so. <laughs> because right when you invested in the series B, it was. We should we should really look at a CFO. And my thought was, are we too early? Uh, and I think a lot of people might think that way. Uh, turns out we weren't. And it's probably the right timing. So we're about a year late. But really the way we looked at it is just finance in different phases when we really took a step back. And we've talked about this a good amount where um, like when I look at finance, it could be first like phase one reporting. Do we actually have the data where we can look at it to say, okay, what did we spend? Like, how do we perform? The next way is, can we get that data consistently? Because it can't just be once a year thing. It's every month. Can we get that reporting to be able to make decisions? Yep. The area that we are really missing on is how do you then take actions on those decisions? So how do you look on a monthly basis and say, okay, this is what we said we were going to do. This is what actually happened. 
Here's where we see the future kind of going from a forecast perspective of market. What decisions can we make right now and keep making those course corrections? And then the thing that we weren't even close to was how is finance a growth lever? So how is finance starting to work with the sales team on building out NPVs and building out ROIs? How are they working with the product team to saying, okay, what will these product bets deliver from a revenue perspective? Mm -hmm. so for us, we were kind of in the very like early stages where like, yeah, we had our house in order, but it wasn't in any way a competitive advantage. It was more just like, great, we can report on it. So that's when we thought, you know what? Like we need to up level across the board. Um, let's go look for someone that fits the profile, fits the culture, like everything that we were looking for. And it was a hard search. Shout out to True Road over there. Like they did a great job helping us out. But uh, super, super thankful that Celeste decided to join. Yeah, and I would describe that phase. By the way, your finance and reporting was better than most companies at that stage. I would I always describe it as like, we're very good at having a scoreboard. So we yeah. can tell people what's happening. But we're not, you know, in that early phase, you're not great at kind of projecting what could happen, thinking about the levers, margins, you know, investments and things like that. And, and so it's a, it's a very natural cycle. And I guess maybe Celeste for you, you know, you're now six months in um, one, how did you and Kevin start to build a relationship and figure out where you were going to focus your efforts? And, you know, I guess sort of two, what are some of the big things that you noticed early on that were things, okay. And you had, you'd worked for startups before, what are what are some of the major areas where you jumped in and started to focus? And then I want to get a little more into like your guys' relationship and how you guys work together. But maybe just talk about like the first few months and where you focus your efforts. Yeah. So so first of all, I think what's important, you know, what was important to me coming to Fair Market were like three things. So number one, as Kevin talked about, we're doing amazing things here at Fair Market, right? We've got amazing logos and it's unbounded. So that unbounded market potential was huge for me and in, in what I was looking for. Secondly, I was looking for a really good leadership team, good humans, right? That's how I want to spend all, all my time around good people, good humans. I second third, that. I yes. second that desire. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then third, it's Kevin himself. Like uh, meeting with Kevin, I felt an immediate kind of bond that he and I can have a very candid, respectful, efficient, effective uh, communication ongoing. And, and he's a big reason why I'm here, especially with this high energy, right? So with that being said, um, there were some things that the finance team had already done. And I just wanted to kind of uh, celebrate that and build upon that. So for instance, they had already brought finance and accounting in-house from an outside an outside vendor, right? So that's a big move in itself. They had already moved from QuickBooks onto NetSuite. That's a big move in itself. They had already uh, gone through their first audit. In fact, we were finishing up the second audit, right? Mm -hmm. So there were already these great things that the team had already built upon. And then my focus was, hey, how do we then begin to have this whole forecasting rigor, right? And that's a hard thing. It's hard to close the books. It's hard to then analyze them and then have a forecast that you're doing monthly that we can mm -hmm. then summarize and then know the levers on cash. So I would say around the, the governance side um, of, of accounting, we kind of have that in place. And then it's more building on the forecasting muscle in the company, right? And so that's been my, my yeah. major focus in the last six months. I, I, will, say, I will say, Jeff, um, she's yes. downplaying how much <laughs> even when she started uh because she joined one month later we started the fundraise which anyone that's gone through a fundraise knows the lift on finance we started doing our budgeting process yeah did, uh comp leveling uh with the war in ukraine we were moving 28 30 people to warsaw and pulling getting that entity stood up uh and then on top of it we ended up having uh hr recruiting um and people aligned to celeste as well so as much as she was presenting this was the priorities she was doing that amidst eight yeah. different things happening that are critical, but her ability to be able to say, okay, this is what's most important. We're going to, these are strategic bets. I'm going to knock these out as we do it. That's what's made her such a great addition because she is able to balance all that together. Yeah. A lot. yeah. And I think Celeste, to your credit, I, one of the things we always talk about is when you see somebody join, you know, oftentimes the great hires make an immediate impact and you mm -hmm. clearly made an immediate impact here. What, um, how much when you let me wind back the clock prior to you joining fair market because i want to give a little bit of insight to founders and ceos who are in kevin's role and are trying to recruit someone like you yep. which is half the battle right i mean you hire a search firm that's great they can put a bunch of candidates yep. in front of you but actually landing that candidate you really want one what were you looking for and yep. two 
what did Kevin and the team do well that helped you understand that the components were there that you just mentioned of what you, you know, what you were looking for? Yeah. So look, I would say, I think the, the numbers, the logos, all of that spoke for itself. Like there yeah. was, I mean, sell, Kevin can sell. There's no doubt about that. And I think maybe had to do a little bit of that. But for the most part, I could see our great metrics in the usage. I could see it in the logos, right? And then I think like everybody I talk to, I love the energy. I love the positivity. I love the culture. And I think, Jeff, you said it really well. You came and visited and talked with our sales team at a you know, kickoff meeting. And I think one main takeaway was that this is really hard. Right. And yeah. it is really hard. I mean, no, there's no other. I say that a lot. <laughs> there's no other better adjective. It's really hard. Yeah. And so while we're going to climb this mountain, like I just wanted that whole team of like true peers and we're in this together. Like that's really what I was looking for. So I think there's companies who were growing like crazy and they had already raised all this money. And we, I knew we wouldn't have to fundraise for a while, but those other major attributes about how I'm going to spend my next X years and my, my potential impact were big for me as I was making that choice. Yeah. And I know a lot of interviewing today happens uh, remotely. How much time did you guys spend together in person? Um, Kevin and I just met each other for the first time. Was that two, two months ago, Kevin? Yeah. No, big bear hug on both sides. So how did you how did you guys get comfortable on a personal level that you could really partner together? Because this relationship is so important as you build a company. You want to go first, Lester? Want me to go? You start. By the way, unscripted, so there's no prep here for the audience. Like, oh yeah, I'm putting Um, you guys on the spot. How did how did you get comfortable? You know, in in because this is a pretty important. You know, Celeste, it was an important decision for you to join, and Kevin, obviously, really important for you decision for you on the company side. Uh, we just spent a ton of time on Zoom getting yeah. into real meaty topics um, in a great way. Celeste was super thorough in terms of like getting into like how we think about the business, how we think about culture, actually digging into like every metric across the board, talking to different members of the team. And um, like you, you can tell from a camaraderie perspective pretty quick, like, is this going to work? Like, how's the trust going to be? Like, obviously, like, there's always some risk, like, you never know. Yeah. Uh, because people can, like, interview very well. But then also talk to a ton of back channels from a references perspective <laughs> and said that, like, it's the best hire we've ever made. Uh, so it, it just, there's so many different data points that kind of added up where, um, like, obviously, it was amazing to meet her in person. But I felt, and as a team, we felt, I know you did as well. Yeah. Very, very, very confident that uh, Celeste would just be a perfect match. And also, Like the biggest thing that I think that uh, we loved about her experience was she's seen so many different flavors and varieties of types of companies in terms of stage, but also in terms of growth, like status. Yeah. Uh, Like, is it high growth or is it low growth? And you're you're focusing on different things, which to me said that she can be adaptable to different situations, which is to to the point you just brought up, Celeste, and you're joking about it, but like, we're going to have to make course corrections. Things are going to come up that we haven't thought about, whatever it is. And if you have someone that, is not open to that. And they kind of like stutter step and freeze a little bit when that happens, doesn't work. If yeah. you have someone that says, great, let's go run at it. And you go, it seems like she had that mentality. But it's less curious to hear how Yeah, no, and I, I would add to also outside of my gut and intuition about like synergies with the team, I did my due diligence too, right? I had gone through, they provided me some info. I went through that and I sent back like a whole page, if I recall, Kevin, like of questions and all of that. So. I was digging in from the very beginning because I, I, I've seen a lot of different P&Ls and a lot of different projections. So I did my own diligence, of course, as well. And you and I, I had a chance to interview Celeste yes. and you asked you asked very thorough questions, um, <laughs> but at the same time brought a real uh, energy and passion, which I think is frankly f- rare. A lot of times when people interview over Zoom, it's hard to get a sense of like, does this person and I... You know, I know Kevin and Tarek and the team well enough to know that we need somebody who's got some good energy in these roles or or you're not going to hang with this crew. So let me let me now take it to where you are today. How do you guys work together? How often do you meet? What are the most important things you cover? Uh, and maybe, you know, Kevin, for you as a CEO, what have you changed in terms of are there things that you have sort of, you know, I wouldn't say delegated, but you rely on heavily for Celeste, maybe even just interplay with other executive team members that you've noticed over the last few months? Um, you know, maybe I'll start there, Kevin, with you. Just how 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 do you manage the relationship? How often do you meet? And then, are there things that you've changed in your working style as you've as Celeste joined the team? Yeah. Um, 
So I, I would say, and, and I said to Celeste when she was coming in, this is viewed as we're, we're doing this together. We're building the company together along with the entire executive team. Um, so for us, like just the trust of everyone has beyond an equal seat at the table uh, and that we truly trust each other, like that's essential. And, and it was pressure tested super fast because we started the fundraise process. And in that, like you're talking five, six times a day, you're being agile, you're reacting to a bunch of different things. And everyone has to execute at the highest level. Like you just have to, you have to be accountable. You can't wait two hours for response a lot of times. It's immediate. And we are able to kind of like trial by fire for our relationship of just like get thrown into it with other mm-hmm. members of our team. Uh, and I think that was what allowed us to probably take what would have taken six months and build a relationship in like a month or two. Um, also because I got to watch her execute at yeah. like that level, which we didn't have previously at Fair Market, which was crucial as we were going through the, the process. Um, beyond that, so I mean, we do have the weekly one-on-ones. So we have like a one hour, uh, we both come with topics, we use Lattice uh, for all of our notes. We make sure to go through different ones. Uh, but then, I mean, I think the, the biggest way we stay connected is like I'll have a running list at a given time. She will as well. Uh, we'll talk every day and it could be a five or 10 minute conversation. It's very to the point. Okay, we're like, we're like, let's make sure we're aligned on this. Uh, is there some things we need to discuss? Great. And then it's always divide and conquer. Yeah. Like we, we shouldn't be on the same meetings um, outside of when we're doing like the, the, some of the reviews from like a reporting perspective, but um, it's the same thing with the other executives. Like it's, if we can't divide and conquer, then we're going to, it's going to be too slow or it's going to be inefficient in terms of what we're working on. Um, I know. I, I also think just like the manner in which we communicate, like, to, like we know there's going to be things we have to work through. It's always a net positive mentality yeah. where it's, it's almost like something comes up. It's, I mean, it's almost like a, a quick, like laugh. All right, let's dig in. Uh, and, and that's the great, and she's an athlete. So, so she's like, that's like, you can tell, and she goes on the weekends and plays tournaments and like really like, like in big intense ter- tennis tournaments. I kind of see that grit and that fire and that competitive spirit. And then that gets me fired up. So she motivates me. So it overall, it's been, uh, and from my perspective, a very healthy working relationship. Yeah, I would add, and I'd also say that I think from the very beginning, I felt in a very, let's call it safe environment where I was given the autonomy to go, you know, observe and, and give my recommendations and stuff. But uh, um, I didn't have all the answers, especially for fundraising, which is really hard. You know, yeah. you, you, know you never know what you throw a PL up or you throw something out, what questions, you know, you're going to get back. And so I, it, there's never been a moment where I didn't feel like Kevin had my back on anything, whether it was something perspective, internal. And I think this last six months, as we, you know, this constant communication in that cadence has allowed us and me to learn the cultural norms a little bit. And then Kevin himself, right? And so I think um, we're continuing to learn, but I'm, we talk all the time and I love it. How about Celeste, what, um, you know, if I had a group of CEOs on right now, we're all managing five to $15 million ARR software businesses. What are the major things that you would, you know, you've worked now at a bunch of companies. What are the major things that you would highlight to them that could be weaknesses or areas that they're not aware of that could be challenging? And I was just curious what advice you'd have for folks. Yeah, it's, I think that's a great question. And I think what I'll also start with that is, you know, I have a pretty good network of peers that I work with in, in my life and finance leaders, it typically come from one of three backgrounds, right? Like they come up through FP&A like myself, maybe they come from banking, okay? And then maybe they come up through accounting. And so each of those backgrounds is gonna have a very unique lens and how they do the business, right? And I think that the teams, how they um, maybe look at their teams, how they look at the business, it's, it's gonna have that lens. And I think there's pros and cons to all of that. So for me, you know, as it retain, pertains to banking or, you know, um, optimizing cash and all of that stuff. My lens has been around the operational piece, right? Like what connected gaps do we have? Um, when I look at the PL, hey, this looks a little heavy. Let's dig it here. How do we scale that? And so um yeah, I think those are those are some things to look at. And to Kevin's point, you know, even when you may see that, how do you like actually bring action to that, right? Um, so if you're trying to beef up your gross margin or does our gross margin make sense and really peeling that back. Um, you know, how do you actually put initiatives in place to make improvements there? Let me get down to like a tactical level that I think has been super important this year for a lot of our companies, which is headcount. How do you guys, you know, and now as we head into the planning process for 2023, how are you guys thinking about planning and headcount and how are you working with the various teams to think about that? Because one of the things that 
you know, a lot of companies in 20 and 21 got way out over their skis on hiring, right? Everybody just built an Excel model and then sort of drew it out with 100% growth. And all of a sudden, we always call it the gremlin problem. All of a sudden, they looked around and were like, holy crap, we got a lot of people in this company. We're not sure all of them are that productive. Yeah. How are you guys thinking about headcount? How do you talk about it? Because that, for most companies at our stage, that is the majority of the expense, um, at least in enterprise software, maybe not in consumer where you're spending a lot of money in marketing, but for enterprise software, it is. And it's so hard to pull it back, as we saw this year with a lot of companies having to do riffs. How are you guys thinking about planning for next year? And, and how does headcount factor into the conversations you're having? I, either one of you can jump in. Yeah. So I think when we started our operating plan, yeah, I mean, headcount is 70 to 80% of our cost, right? So that is the big lever. Yeah. And so I think it, it's hard because you go out and you ask the business what they need to meet these objectives and they give you the kitchen sink, right? Which isn't realistic. It's never realistic. And right. I think it's always interesting where we look at the next operating year as some big event. It's actually the next day after this year ends, right? It's just a continuum of that. So I think part of the exercise early on was really digging in on where, where do we actually need headcount, right? And so what we ended up doing was putting together, getting all those requirements, putting together a plan but then also knowing and revisiting it very often um, and, and around Kevin's directs, um, knowing you know, where we can push and pull, depending on you know, how the business was progressing in you know, each quarter and a half as the year progresses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the other, the other interesting thing is that while Kevin talked about the change, you know, the people team ended up aligning under me as well very early on. So you know, we were lock and step with what recs were on the website, what was approved, you know, what the whole process underneath that. So really tight synergy and governance there. Kevin, I mean, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the idea that uh, recruiting is rolling uh, and working with Celeste is huge because like that's the biggest way to control it. It's like having those static plans that the role, the recs just keep getting open, they get filled. And then by the time you realize that you're, you're a little you're over your skis, You've already hired six or seven more people right. starting in a couple months. You have a star class of six people and you're like, we just had this conversation a month ago. So the idea that we're proactively doing it and then figuring out like, it will, I guess, saying the culture with the entire company that these aren't static plans, that these are going to change on a monthly basis. It's not a negative. Like right. you need to do it because we're going to want to double down some areas that we didn't think we were going to. Yeah, I love that. We want to pull back in some areas. Yeah. But if if the the culture... And it's, it's hard and like, we're still working on it. But if the culture is like, hey, this is my budget. I get to hire these people. Like that's not a way to build a massive company that is supporting your customers and supporting the industry is going. It's okay. As a company, we want to balance the growth and efficiency. We want to be able to make those trade-offs. And that will mean taking budgets from different areas or allocating budgets to different areas. Yep. If you don't have that culture, it feels like, hey, that's mine. We're losing it. How come our team's being overworked? Which, which is fair though. So it, it's, it's explaining the why behind yeah. like, like Celeste right now does a monthly meeting. So we started to do a town hall where Celeste goes through all the SAS, the SAS metrics, what they are, what they mean. Oh, that's uh, great. Really so you're sharing that with everybody. Yeah, that's share awesome. With everyone. Because then it's to Celeste's point earlier, if we can start to say, okay, in X, Y, Z months, that's our path to free cash flow. Uh, and it might not be perfect and we make decisions along the way, but that's our path. So when we're starting to talk about, okay, how are we being efficient? It's the why behind it. So we can kind of control our destiny in the future as well. Love that. And what do you guys, one of the age old, you know, this is probably going, going back to the caveman era, but like one of the big challenges that a lot of CEOs and CFOs wrestle with is, you know, as we're putting together our plan, how aggressive should we be, right? Kevin, you and I have been talking about this monthly since I think we invested, you know, and everybody's kind of like, we want to be aggressive enough. So we feel like we're pushing the envelopes and challenging ourselves. We also want to have a plan that's realistic that we think we can meet or beat. There's no right answer, right? There will never be a right answer in building companies. But how have you guys approached that? And how have you thought about that as you've gone into this planning cycle? Anything you can share with, with folks I think would be valuable. Yeah. And I think we we started that, right? With the operating plan that was already underway when I started. It was sort of like, okay, we can grow 120%, 100%, 80%. And all of those have different, you know, all of those scenarios have different um, requirements and, and realism in it, right? Um, I also think though, given the state of the market, uh, we had to have, take some realities there. So I would also say we we kind of embarked on this controlled growth strategy that we were that we were describing before, which is we need to be realistic about the state of the market and, and what's going yeah. on more conservative, with, of which I'm a very conservative person. So um, I, I'm, I'm glad we landed on that approach. Yeah. And 
the the interesting part is it seems like every quarter uh, the most important metric changes from the market perspective, not from uh-huh. the standpoint. So like when we were going through the raise process, everyone was talking about burn ratios. But then one VC actually started laughing of six months ago, you never even like heard any company report in their burn ratio. So just overall cash versus new ARR. And the, 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 I guess the tricky thing is as all this noise is in the market around like what's the most important metric, it's staying true to, okay, what do we believe are the core metrics that we should look at? Because then if we 100%. have that, then we can make decisions, that. but not thrash. Because um, you're building do- a company over the next five to 10 years, right? You can't build it for Q4 of 22. Exactly. I, yeah. I guess so, so that's one thing though, is as much as we say 70, 80% of our costs is people, yep. that, that's still 20 or 30%. Yes. You want to walk through what we're doing for that 20? Yeah. Days? And I think that's a really important point, which is yes, you know, current and new headcount, that's a big part of your spend, right? But then the other piece is, you know, how much of this is under discretion, like full discretion? How much of it is already locked up in, into contracts? How much of it is like, T&E and those kinds of things, right? So I think the company already had a culture of like, spend it like it's yours. And so wanted to definitely reiterate and and embrace that because we really need to be doing that, right? So if everybody is is keeping that in mind while we're beginning to travel, we need to go on site for customer calls and those things, but we also need to be mindful of things that matter and they add up. So I think there's a lot of, um, you know, different initiatives in place around those areas of non-headcount STEM as well. Let me ask you a really hard question. Have you guys disagreed on anything in the last six months? <laughs> I, I'm sure we have. Um, Celeste, you're smiling. Anything come to mind? Got, you know, no. I, I might have just forgot. I'm sure we yeah, have. I, I actually can't think of like one specific instance where, and I feel like for me, you know, my main thing about coming into this new company and new culture was to, to observe and listen, listen more than I speak, right? And so I'm more so morphing in, I'm more the newcomer here. And so it's more for me understanding how things are done. But no, I can't, remember, I can't think of anything that we blatantly disagree on, actually. You no, know, I can't think of anything big. I'm sure there's a bunch of like small things that yeah. we just go back and forth on. Uh, but there's been no, I mean, at the core of it, um, we make decisions based off of doing the right thing by people being ethical when you make decisions um, and, and, and like following logic. So if you're doing that, like once again, there's gonna be like little deviations on like what the path is, but it, it's not gonna be a big, hey, like, is this like it, if you have the same, it's why we have core values at fair market. They're so big at fair market. Yeah. Because it's the foundation for how we disagree because they like, like it's okay to disagree. It's great to have different opinions, but then it's debate and commit. And, yeah. and then we're all going in the same direction. Yeah. And I would also say my, my compass for like, does this make rational sense? Like Kevin and I are mostly aligned just innately in that way. So that's good. I love it. Well, uh, uh, Celeste, we're super glad you're on board. I know it's been six months, but it seems like yesterday. And and I know Kevin has really appreciated the impact you've made. And, you know, as a board and investors, you've been an awesome addition. So we're, we're psyched you're on board and I think the uh, the future looks very bright for fair market. We got plenty of cash in the bank. And I love the, you know, I was talking to one of our LPs last week and they were saying, hey, what's going to happen to this class of companies that are kind of at series B, C, D, given the market? And I said, well, at some level, it's it's pretty awesome to have this shock to the system now so you can create an operating playbook for your company that is, you know, to your point, Kevin, not subject to the whims of the market. It's like, hey guys, let's build a great business that can survive and thrive for the next decade. And then we'll let valuations and everything else fall where they fall. But we're out of the mode of, you know, being stuffed like geese with with money and having to spend it. So I think you guys have just got a great, great opportunity in front of you. Thank you. And thanks for your uh, support. It's awesome to have uh, you on the board and your guidance and recommendations and support means a lot. For anyone awesome. listening, if you're thinking about uh, a CFO and bringing one in, probably do it a little sooner than you thought. <laughs> I know that's the theme. I know that's the theme, but I'm just gonna say it, and then hope we get. Uh, you're, you're, I love every single software CEO I've ever worked with who brings in a great CFO becomes a believer and a and a and a gospel spreader of that message. So thanks, Kevin. Yeah, of course. Thank thanks you both. Appreciate it. Thank you so Have much. An awesome weekend.